Good morning, Vienna. Okay, many cultures use the expression night and day to describe opposites that are somehow surprising. Twins that behave completely differently despite that they look the same. Someone who's drastically changed their behavior, perhaps going from drinking way too much to nothing at all. It's like night and day. Of course, when we say this, it's actually a metaphor that refers to the stunning transformation that the Earth goes through every day as it rotates on its axis, alternately sampling warmer light environments and darker cold ones. It's like night and day. There's nothing as different as night from night than day. And we pass between these two states every single day without exception. Evolution is all about uh, developing adaptations to special environments through genetic change. And so it stands to reason that evolution has given us a mechanism to deal with this special environment, a mechanism embedded in our genes, and a me mechanism that actually samples and uh, tastes the environment that's alternating uh, without, um, um, un with high predictability. And that mechanism is the biological clock or the circadian clock. So what is the circadian clock and what does it do for us? One of the most impressive examples that I know about are experiments that take people like you or me and put them into a time-free environment. A subject goes into a specially designed apartment, usually just a single room, that has no access to information from the outside world. So there's no clock on the wall, there's no window, and there's no noise from outside activities. In this situation, a subject lives not with a, a precise 24-hour rhythm, they don't maintain that, but they go to a circa 24-hour rhythm in sleep-wake behavior, for instance. They basically sleep and wake with the same interval every day, but it's a little bit less than 24 hours or a little bit more than 24 hours. So it's a persistent oscillation in our behavior in the absence of daily time cues. And this is called and this is called a circadian rhythm, with the word circadian coming from the Latin for about a day. So, um, so I think about how this works, that you have no information from outside and you still can do this um, uh, quite reliably in constant conditions. Um, this is what we mean by an internal clock, a biological clock, or a circadian clock, right? So it's an alarm clock that's built into our heads that's telling us when to wake up. And then I have to say that I've been studying the circadian clock for over 20 years now, and I still am, I still am incredibly impressed and amazed, and it's still almost unbelievable to me that we, who are so complex and strong-willed in our behaviors, show this persistent, self-sustained circadian rhythm in, in, in sleeping and waking, for instance, and in many other things also. But I've seen so many examples of this 24-hour timing mechanism in bacteria, in fungi, in plants, in humans and other animals, that there's no question in my mind that it's a fundamental part of biology. So, as you probably know, experiments that put humans or any other living organism into a time-free environment, like I just described, are actually highly artificial, and they actually never really happen in real life. And you also probably know that your sleep-wake cycle is, is uh, actually, on average, exactly 24 hours. This process of adjustment of this circa 24-hour rhythm to exactly 24 hours is called circadian entrainment. And for our sleep-wake behavior, it's mediated um, by specialized cells in our retina that sense light. The biological clock, however, is built of many more cells than just a few cells in the eye or the brain. Basically, all of our cells are oscillating. What do these cellular oscillations look like? Well, we can measure oscillations in RNA levels, for instance, in gene expression or RNA levels in, in individual cells. And you see here a tracing of cells that are carrying on for five or six or seven days in constant conditions. So about 10% of the genes in any given cell are expressed with a circadian rhythm. Of these, some of the proteins will also be rhythmic, and metabolism will become rhythmic also. And so you get a network of oscillations in each cell that eventually come together so that you get higher functions that are also rhythmic. 
Now, these cellular oscillations are generally not entrained by light. That's a, light entrainment is, is unique to cells emanating from the eye, in the eye, or connected to the eye, those cells. These peripheral cells, in general, will entrain to temperatures in our, uh, to, to cycles in our body temperature. So our temperature is one to two degrees higher at the end of the afternoon than it is at the end of the night. So now you should start to get a picture of the circadian clock in a human, for instance. It's all kinds of oscillating cells, really literally all kinds of cells that are oscillating. They're responding to various time cues, light, temperature, also nutritional status and hormone levels, for instance. And then they come together to regulate many, many processes. So cognitive performance changes over the course of the day. The perception of pain peaks in the evening. Physical performance, like grip strength, peaks mid-afternoon. And components of our blood, like the metabolic state of cells or hormone levels, is also circulating with predictable rhythms over the course of the day. Andre Gide wrote a wonderfully perceptive sentence, if I were not there to make them acquainted, my morning self would not know my evenings. This is really perfect. We are different people night and day. Um, so what does, the, what does this mean for us? In, in everyday life. Um, the circadian clock regulates the, the timing of our behavior. It, it determines our chronotype. Chronotype is measured by asking people when they sleep on a free day with no obligations. And like many behaviors, it shows a distribution. You get a few people who are sleeping very early in the day. You get most people who are sleeping similar, at similar times to each other. And then you get some people who are sleeping quite late. And yes, you can see that teenagers and young adults are disproportionately represented in this late um, population. They sleep much later than young children and older adults. Um, that makes me think back to actually what Gide wrote about being different people morning and evening. And I think that this explains a lot of the conflict between parents and teenagers, that basically their the timing of their behaviors is totally misaligned. That's all it is. <laughs> OK, so what else? OK, so, so I told you about age and how that regulates chronotype. And so think about this also, that as you go through life then, you, pa you naturally pass through a series of chronotypes moving from early to late and then early again. OK? So what else, in, uh, what else regulates chronotype or the timing of our behavior? Um, the, one of the answers is genes. And uh, the most compelling, um, not the most compelling, excuse me, the first data that, um, that informed us about the genes that are involved in regulating the circadian clock came from fruit flies. And we now have a lot of genes that regulate the circadian clock in human, isolated human cells. Interestingly, when we look at humans themselves, it's much more difficult to figure out which genes are involved in regulating chronotype. The most compelling examples come from large family pedigrees where an extreme chronotype is inherited as a dominant trait. However, the DNA sequences responsible for those traits are actually not found in the general population. So my conclusion from these observations is that the genes that are involved in regulating chronotype are actually many, with each having individual small effects in the general population at least, and, um, uh, and therefore very hard to track by standard genetics methods. Another way that the, the chronotype is regulated is with light. So I mentioned that the clock is designed to actually sample the environment. So perhaps it's not surprising that it actually checks in and uses some of the information from the environment. So how do we know that this, this is so? If you live in a higher light environment compared to a lower light environment, so someone who gets outside compared to someone who's inside all the time, you'll generally have an earlier chronotype versus a later one, respectively. If you live in the eastern part of a time zone, like in Vienna, uh, compared to the western part of the time zone, you'll have an earlier versus a later chronotype. And of course, this is because we express chronotype as local time, whereas your clock is reading sun time. Um, there's some evidence that we entrain differently in the summer, that's earlier in the summer, than in the winter, where we entrain later. It might also help you to think about jet lag to understand intuitively how light feeds into the clock. So with jet lag, you've flown across time zones 
and it takes a really surprisingly long time to readjust to the new time, and you feel really bad in the process as your clock is running ahead or lagging behind of the new sun time. Eventually, you're, you find a relative stable phase of circadian entrainment that's consistent for your chronotype in your new environment. You feel better, you can sleep again, and you get your energy back. So what are the implications about all of this for you in your everyday life? Um, first of all, I think it's pretty clear that you will have a fundamentally different circadian clock and therefore chronotype from your neighbors. So you have different genes, you have a different age, and you have a different light history. I want to do a little experiment here. I want to um, let you understand that by actually comparing yourself to others, which is actually a really good way to make people understand this um, very quickly. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand um, and tell us and report to us when you prefer to go to sleep on a free day with no social obligations, OK? So who goes to bed before midnight? OK, look around and see how many hands are up. How about midnight to 1? One to two. Two to three. <laughs> and after three. There are some, there should be some people in here after three. So you've just reconstructed the chronotype distribution right here in this, in this room. So now you see how it works. I recently came across a dramatic story concerning chronotype. This is a picture of the famous castle Neuschwanstein. It was built by Ludwig II, who became the king of Bavaria in 1864 at the age of 18. 22 years later, he was forcibly removed from the throne when he was pronounced insane by a board of psychiatrists who had never examined him. Ludwig may have had some troubles in the mental health department. I think no one can know for sure. It's history. What we do know is that despite some considerable popularity with his subjects, the government was deeply disturbed that through his palaces and castles that he was building, he was pushing the state to the brink of bankruptcy. They wanted him out. When I read a bit more about the life, the daily life of Ludwig, I became suspicious of the diagnosis of mental illness. Certainly, he wasn't coping very well in general, and he practiced some eccentric behaviors. But the most specific description concerned the timing of his behavior. He ordered breakfast at 6 in the evening, lunch at midnight, and dinner in the early morning before retiring to bed to sleep through the day. Very rarely one finds a reverse chronotype like Ludwig had. He seems indeed to have been most relaxed at Schloss Linderhof here, where he famously was riding around in his sleigh through the night around the grounds. In contrast, his official duties would have taken place during the daylight hours, which was unfortunately during his nighttime. Think about how you would feel if you had to negotiate anything in the middle of your night. Ludwig found himself negotiating the independence of Bavaria in the middle of his night, and he lost it. This misstep essentially created the German Empire. I find myself wondering if the chronotype of Ludwig II changed the history of the world. <laughs> That's, of course, impossible to say, but extreme examples like this are very useful for making a point. And the point here is that, like other living creatures, we have our own individual circadian clock that, in combination with our age and our light exposure, will make us a certain chronotype. Um, our clock directs the timing of our behavior. Our chronotype is so strong that it sometimes, sometimes isolates us, like it did Ludwig II. It does this in small ways when we want to be with someone who has a different chronotype. Maybe we feel like doing something that they don't feel like doing. Our chronotype is so strong that sometimes we have to modify it with an alarm clock. 
Otherwise, you might get in trouble with work or school. Both of these scenarios are suboptimal. One of them results in um, um, social relationships that suffer, and the other one re result, <laughs> results in sleep deprivation as a result of the, the clash of the biological and the social clock. This is a condition we call social jet lag. And sleep deprivation is known to lead to a variety of problems ranging from poor performance to illness. Is there anything then that you can do to fine tune your chronotype so that you can have more harmonious time with family and friends and you can lose less sleep to your work? Can you unshackle yourself from your clock? The answer is almost certainly. Um, if you think back to what I said regulates chronotype, that would be genes, light, and age. Two of those things you can't change overnight. But light is something that we can work with. It's easy to find, it's cheap, and it's not unpleasant. So um, the only problem is that we don't have very good prescriptions for how light will interact with your specific chronotype. Because remember, you have a unique collection of clock genes that we don't really understand yet. So we don't know how they would react to light. There is a general rule that most people, however, if they increase the light they get in the morning and decrease the light they get in the evening, for instance, from computers and televisions, that they will tend to move earlier in their chronotype and therefore have to use their alarm clock less. OK? OK, 80% of you out there are alarm clock users. This should remind you every single day that you have a circadian clock. Your clock is showing itself in your individual cells. It's showing, your, showing itself in your family and in your community. Despite the alarm clock, which I hope you'll use now much less, the circadian clock is a wonderful addition to our poor existence. It gives us more versions of ourselves. We are, after all, different people morning and evening. Get to know you. And since I'm a scientist, I have to acknowledge my dear colleagues, because no scientist stands up here alone um, without a huge team behind them. Maria and David, who are here today, Till Ronneberg, who's written the, rewritten the book on human behavior, and many chronobiologists, and please do discover your chronotype at this web address. Thank you very much. <laughs>